Okay, so you've just returned from a walk with your furry friend and you find a tick. What do you do with it? How do you know if that tick on you or on your pet is carrying Lyme or any other tick-borne disease? Well, you send it off to the lab, hopefully. And that's exactly where we're headed on this podcast of looking at Lyme. We will meet a scientist at the cutting edge of tick research. Thank you for coming with us. This is guaranteed to be thought-provoking. Dr. Vet Lloyd was in her garden when she was bitten by a tick, and like me, she got sick and didn't really know what to do about it. Dr. Lloyd chose to dedicate her life to the science of ticks, which leads to better public knowledge. She heads up the research lab at Mount Allison University in Sackville, New Brunswick. Hello, Dr. Lloyd. Hello. Very nice to talk to you today. How did you get involved in doing Lyme research at Mount Allison University? Um, well, I got involved in Lyme research in what I suspect is a fairly traditional way for many Lyme disease researchers. I was personally affected by it. Um, I'm an avid gardener, and I was out in my garden, uh, came back in and discovered this thing hanging off my shoulder. Now, I'd known what ticks are because I'd pulled enough off my dogs up until that point, so I pulled it out. Um and phoned in and got the public health advice. At that time, unfortunately, the public health advice wasn't enormously helpful. I was assured that it wasn't a tick because there were no ticks. So I argued that point. Um, They suggested I could submit it for testing, but then they discarded it because there were no ticks in New Brunswick. So um, I ended up getting quite ill. Um, I was lucky enough to have colleagues, uh, particularly out West, who were much better informed about Lyme disease than I was. And they introduced me to the idea that if you get a fever shortly after the tick bite, if you then get migratory arthritis, if you've got a red rash around the tick bite, yeah, all of this is a problem. Um, And thanks to their prodding, I was able to get treatment, not in time for it to be quick and easy, but I did eventually recover recover my health. Now, uh, that's my personal story. Where I got, where that touched on research is that I am a researcher. I have a lab that's equipped to do molecular biology, which is basically take perfectly good organisms and bits of organisms and turn them into DNA. At that point, we were working on a number of fundamental research questions, very interesting, but not critical to people's health and cancer. And I realized very quickly that the same tools could be used to shed some light on Lyme disease. And although Certainly cancer is a tremendously serious disease that touches many lives. There are many cancer researchers and there are relatively few Lyme disease researchers. So I felt that I could do more by working on ticks and the various pathogens ticks contain than anything else. So I persuaded the lab, which is full of energetic, young, wonderful people (laughs) who really want to help. And I said, well, we're going to start on ticks and uh, see what we can do with them. That is amazing. So what would a typical day in your lab look like then? Can you walk us through what that might look like? Um, well, we all show up at the crack of mid-morning. <laughs> um, it's a lab full of young people, so the day doesn't crack quite as early for them as it does for me. Uh, collect the mail, which will contain ticks. We have a uh, a service and a research project. It's a, a community science project where if people find ticks on themselves or their pets, ideally their pets, or just on wildlife that they come across, they can send it to us. We identify it and test it to see if it has Lyme disease. So every day I go to mount to the mailbox and it's just like it's Christmas time, except <laughs> that instead of nice letters with sparkly Santas, I get sort of gooey mashed ticks. Actually, um, can I ask you I'm a quick question about, about that? I just want to double check. Yeah. So if people are sending you ticks, they don't need to be frozen or even alive. Is that true? 
Um, no, I prefer that they not be alive. Okay. And if they are alive, they don't stay alive very long. Uh, no, but to be a bit less facetious, for the sake of the safety of postal workers, they should be dead. And the best way to kill them is to chuck them in your freezer for a few days. Ticks are tough, but after a few days of being frozen, they will give up the ghost and be kind enough to die. Okay. Yeah, they're very uh, resilient creatures, aren't they? Well, they will. If you just put them in the freezer overnight, once you thaw them out, they actually quite alarmingly will just sort of shake themselves out and start walking again. So it wow. does take a few days. Yeah. And my understanding is when people ship through Canada Post or anybody, they need to double, like double, put put those ticks in two containers to make sure that they're protecting, like you say, the postal workers. Yeah. If they're, if they're dead, uh, that protects the postal workers. The two containers is a great way of protecting uh, your tick from falling out. Uh, but double, uh, because the ticks, I mean, they're just nasty. Two containers is an excellent idea. <laughs> <laughs> and Catlime has these really lovely tick, uh, tick kits, uh, which includes a small container for shipping ticks. So... We've we've received a number of those, and those really are among the best ways to send a tick. So the day starts with getting ticks. Uh, we take them to the lab. We identify them. Um, there are the information is recorded. When people submit ticks, we need to know where it came from and when it was found. Uh, that's just for the tick surveillance program. Then we're going to extract the DNA. When we extract the DNA, it has the DNA of the Lyme disease bacteria in it. If it's present, um, we amplify that with polymerase chain reaction, get the results, and then as long as the person has uh, remembered to include an email address on there, we tell them what we found in the, in the tick that they sent in. Wow. And what's the turnaround time on that if people are able to send you their ticks? Um, it's about two weeks in the lab. Something that's a bit frustrating for people is uh, that is two weeks in the lab. It's not two weeks from when you pop it into the mailbox. Right. Absolutely. And so do you obtain ticks in other ways besides uh, people just sending them to you if they find them on their body or if they find them on their animals, their pets? Yeah. And primarily we get ticks from animals. Um, and that's um, a reflection of the fact that until recently there's been fairly good tick testing through the hospital system for ticks on people in this part of the world. Um, but if we're not getting enough ticks sent to us, sometimes we actually have to be a bit less lazy and go out into the world. And we do what's called active tick surveillance, which can sounds a whole lot better than it is. You dress up in a painter suit, which you call a biohazard suit, um, but you buy it for $5 at the local thrift store. <laughs> um, you drag a piece of flannel behind you that you've previously rubbed all over a wet, smelly dog to make it slightly more attractive to the ticks. <laughs> and then you just drag it through the brush and you're looking for any ticks that are present and that are stupid enough or desperate enough to latch onto the drag to do that. And then you collect them. Um, we also partner, everything in the lab we do is in partnership with the community, and that's just because that's the right thing to do. So we partner with hunters, so when they bring down a uh, game, many of them will go through it and send us uh, whatever ticks they found on um, the deer or the moose or the coyote or the fox, whatever it is they've trapped or hunted or shot. How important is engaging community in your research? It's absolutely critical, and there are a number of reasons for that. The most important reason is that it's just the right thing to do. We Science is not something that happens in secret laboratories buried in bunkers somewhere, and it's not in an ivory tower. In order to be relevant, science uh, and scientists are part of society, and we have to work with the communities uh, in which we live. The other reason is that the point of science is to help people. So if you're not working with people, you won't know what people need uh, in order, what the information is people need, what the resources they need. 
So we work with individuals by, who support our our work by sending in ticks, which is wonderful. For the most part, we don't have to go out and chase them. People send it to us. That appeals to me as someone who's fundamentally lazy. Um, we work with hunters. We work with people who work professionally outside in the forest industry. We're working with cat owners. Uh, a lot of the animals that carry Borrelia in the wild are mice, wild rodents. And there is no animal better at uh, capturing rodents than your, you know, Kitty the cat. Uh, Fluffy, when not napping 20 hours a day, uh, if Fluffy goes outside, uh, Fluffy, she or he may snack on a mouse, bring it to you because Fluffy is generous and also full. We have people who donate those mice, and that's part of a really important wildlife and rodent biobank we have. So really everything we do is supported by the community and we want to give back to the community by doing the research that's needed and relevant. So just to clarify that, we want to make sure that cat owners are not sending you dead mice in the mail, right? (laughs) (laughs) We love cat owners, love cats who are contributing to science. Um, But no, please do not mail flat ice in the mail. Uh, The postal workers will not appreciate it. And by the time it gets here, to be honest, I won't either. Uh, This is a a local maritime initiative where we can pick up the mice before they get uh, too smelly. That's so interesting that you work with uh, so many different community members. Have you done any research with the Lyme disease patient community? Yes. And that's a very important community when we're talking about ticks and tick-borne diseases. So, and and again, central to what we do is responding to the community. We look to the community to say what sort of research needs to be done. Uh, That's just part of being a good scientist. We need to know what questions are to be asked. What's the question? So one of the questions that people approached us with was, you know, I went to the States and got Lyme disease treatment that I couldn't get in Canada and I got better. Or someone from my town or community did that and they're get they're better now. Can why well, the first question people ask is why doesn't that happen in Canada, which is a very difficult, complicated question because it involves politics. But where the science can come into that is we can then say, thank you, that's a really good question. That's an important question. And the first thing to do is actually do a study to find out what percentage of people. So don't just look at one person's experience. That's really important, particularly for that person. But let's look at the experiences of several hundred people. Let's find out what treatment they got and what happened. How many had problems with the treatment? What was the treatment? How many got better? How long did it take? All those questions. So we approached one physician in the States who treats a number of Canadian patients, many Canadian patients, um, and asked his permission to look at his anonymized patient's files. We didn't look at anyone's personal data. And he said, yes, we could do that, which is really an enormous gesture of trust, because once he says, yes, we'll strip the people's names out of the data, and of course, we do all the research ethics approvals for this first, but once he gives us the information, he has no knowledge of what we're doing, he has no control over it, so if we find, oh, this guy is really not doing a good job of his patients, um, he has no control over that. But he had trust and confidence in what he did because he knew that his patients were getting better. So we did all the fancy statistics and we found out what the doctor already knew, which is that his patients get better. Where would people find that research? Is that uh, on your website? Um, yes, it is. So that's a fairly recent publication um, and it's linked on our website. Now, you you mentioned something there about tick testing changing recently in the hospitals in your area. Are you able to comment on that? Um, 
there there have the ability of the medical system to deal with ticks coming in on people uh, varies by over time. Um, basically, it depends on local capacity to test the ticks and overload. So I think with COVID, as far as I know, that's not happening these days. So that's great that they know they have other options to submit testing, the ticks for testing with you. Yeah. And and as uh, uh, if you just want to know the species of the tick, you don't actually have to send the tick in. You can send a half-decent picture to me by email, or you can submit a picture to eTick and they'll identify the species. Oh, that's great. But it won't tell you whether that particular tick was infected or not, just what what that species of tick is. And that's helpful for people to know because some uh, species of ticks are more likely to carry uh, Lyme and pathogens than others. Yes, that's right. And so just to clarify, you look at the tick DNA, you 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 take it apart, and then yeah. you determine which pathogens it might be carrying. So what kind of pathogens are, are you testing for? Um, we do, at this point, we're doing a very focused um, analysis, and that's simply driven by the fact that uh, the more pathogens you test for, the more expensive it is, and we're run, doing this on a shoestring, shoestring budget. So we're looking for Borrelia burgdorferi, Borrelia miyamotoi, and Borrelia bisseti. We have limited capacity to pick up some new Borrelia species, but we routinely don't test for anything other than Borrelia. If you want testing for things other than Borrelia, your best bet in Canada is a company called Genetics, and that that uh, it's a pun on ticks, so it's <laughs> gene ticks. Oh yeah, that's great. We did interview uh, Justin in one of the earlier podcasts. He was one of our first uh, people on the podcast, actually. So if people want to learn more about that, I'm gonna guess it's episode two or three if they want to go back. He's a great scientist, um, and he's doing really good testing. We've certainly worked together to hone the testing and we work together to come up with new tests. That's great. Now, do you have any, are you able to share any of your research findings with us that have maybe been published? I know that you're always doing new research and as a scientist, you need to protect your findings till they're published. <laughs> um, well, I can talk. I mean, we're always doing many things and as long as it doesn't talk about the health of an individual, we can certainly talk about it prior to publication. Um, with the ticks, most of the research has, well, it's focused on two things. One is where are the ticks uh, as it gets warmer, and that's uh, courtesy of climate change. It's easier for ticks to survive the winter. Um, also, the animals they feed on are changing their distribution. So th we're getting more ticks in different places than we had before. So we've been monitoring the spread of ticks. We've monitored the spread of ticks into New Brunswick. Um, we're working a little bit on PEI. Um, so that's the tick distribution. We're also worrying about uh, a tick that's locally called the wood tick or uh, sometimes the American dog tick. And that too is sort of trotting along behind the black legged tick. Um, and invading further north. So we wor worry about where ticks are being found. The other thing we worry about is where what they're carrying. So we've been monitoring for different Borrelia species, Borrelia miyamotoi, Borrelia bisseti. We're certainly on the lookout for the European types of Lyme disease in ticks. And the reason we're worried about that is that can be brought across the ocean from Europe um, by birds, uh, as well as other things that travel across the ocean, which used to be people before COVID um, and pets. Mm -hmm. So we're worrying about ticks that are introduced carrying unusual pathogens. The European types of Lyme disease bacteria are particularly worrying because they wouldn't be expected to be picked up on the standard serology, the standard blood tests that are done right now, uh, but you'll still be very sick. Uh, 
so we do need to know to what extent it's here, where it is, when it when it arrives. I think it's just a matter of time. There have been early reports already, because then we're going to have to start expanding the testing options available for people if we're going to be able to help. Absolutely, the diagnosis they need. And are are you finding all of those species of Borrelia in New Brunswick and PEI? Um, we have not found the European ones locally. Other researchers have uh, reported the European Borrelia in remote, remote, remote islands off Newfoundland and some other remote islands off the Maritimes as well. We haven't found it on the mainland, mainland yet. We're certainly looking, but not yet. Right. Do you notice any seasonal patterns, for example, when nymphs might be more prevalent? We certainly see the the spring tick season and the fall tick season. Uh, the fall tick season is a bit misnamed because it goes through to December. The thing to remember is that these are peak seasons, but you can encounter a tick pretty much at any time. Uh, the ch- It's just the chances of encountering it are higher in the spring and higher in the fall. Um, but if you are in a high tick area, really, you basically just have to incorporate a tick check into your nightly routine. Uh, I learned that the one the hard way. It would be wonderful to t- talk to people who started doing tick checks before they found the first tick on themselves. And if people wanted to find out more about your tick distribution research, the surveillance, um, is there a place they can find that data? Um well, of course, everyone wants nothing more than to spend Christmas curled up by the fire <laughs> reading a scientific paper. Um, but should that not be your ideal way of spending the holiday time or indeed any time at all, there's something called the Tick Information Portal, which is essentially a way of putting our tick data on a slightly more readily digestible site. Uh, You can also poke at my lab website. Uh, Thanks to the work of the wonderful students in the lab, it's much more up to date than when I was maintaining it. Um, That's great. We'll make sure we post the link to that in our in our podcast notes for sure. And so for the general public, what do you think would be one of the biggest misconceptions about either ticks or Lyme disease? Um, hmm, That's a toughie. I think the people in the community um, are well aware that ticks are here simply because they're finding them. Uh, so there, do- I don't think there's a misconcept any mi- any problem there. Uh, certainly, some of the messaging through the public health system could be more up to date. There, there's. I would say at this point, there's good community level awareness of the problem. The veterinary community at the whole, on the whole is very well versed on the diseases ticks carry. Uh, that's because they work with animals and animals are a prime target of ticks. And just the community as a whole tends to be very scientifically oriented. Uh, So your veterinarian is a good source of information on ticks. Okay, that's great. So are are you pretty optimistic about the future of Lyme disease and uh, diagnosis and treatment in Canada? No. Um, (laughs) That's fair. (laughs) I think we have a major hurdle within the human health system There's always been a lag between scientific knowledge and its incorporation into any kind of applied setting. And a quick translation of research to application is considered to be 10 years. That really is not acceptable when we're talking about something that affects people so badly, affects health, well-being, not just of the individual who's got Lyme disease, but their families, their communities. And it can, particularly if untreated and you let it go, it can be fatal. So 
waiting 10 years for the medicine, for the diagnostics and the treatment options to catch up is just not going to do it. I think your podcast has probably mentioned before the sort of battle between the two groups um, who have different ideas about treatment options. To some extent, uh, Canada has simply adopted the rancor and disagreement that seems to be brewing in the States or has brewed um, in the States. And we have that same problem where we have two guidelines and people will defend their guideline to the death. What's not happening is an actual scientific study. Let's take a bunch of patients inform them that they're part of a study where you can have this treatment guideline, you can be treated under treatment guideline A or treatment guideline B, you can pick, Mm -hmm. and then we'll find out what happens. And we really need to find out what works because people are suffering, people are sick, and we have to stop arguing and just getting on, just get on and help people. Yeah. And really just that awareness that, you know, it is a preventable disease and just raising that awareness so people are aware of that when they're spending times, even gardening, right? I I mean, most gardeners would never think of that as being a dangerous activity. So um, I... You don't garden the way I do that. (laughs) Um, Yes. I mean, it is to some extent a preventable disease um, and certainly doing tick checks will help. As the number of ticks increase, it's going to be harder to prevent. On the other hand, if we look at people in the States who are living in tick high density sites, they're not living in biohazard suits. They still go outside and enjoy the the outdoors. Uh, They just learn to live with ticks. And we have to get to that point where doing a tick check at the end of the night is just what you do. You brush your teeth, you check yourself for ticks. Absolutely. Well, we're going to keep doing everything we can do on this podcast to continue raising the awareness and hopefully the uh, diagnosis and treatment continues to improve across Canada. Um, I just want to thank you so much for your time and your expertise. And I would love to have you back on the podcast anytime to talk about your research as it rolls out. So thank you so much, Dr. Lloyd, for your time. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for your efforts to educate people and to advocate for people who need that diagnosis and treatment to recover their health. Dr. Vet Lloyd conducts important research at her lab at Mount Allison University in Sackville, New Brunswick. She is at the leading edge of tick research in Canada. I loved hearing how she's meeting the needs of diverse communities and engaging them in scientific projects. That is the way to get the public involved. I'm Sarah Cormode. Thank you as always for listening and stay safe in the outdoors. Mm-hmm.